good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Ria Stuti from ADC Jakarta. I'm a secretary to ADC Jakarta. On behalf of ADC Jakarta staff, we welcome you all for the to the uh, ADC Jakarta webinar on sports science, on biomechanics and physiotherapy. And before we start with the class with, with, with Mr. York Statesman team, so we would like to invite Pak Rial Mutwarso as ADC Jakarta Director to give the opening remark. Please Pak Rial Mutwarso, time is yours. Thank you very much Ria. Uh, don't forget everybody because we have two Ria in ADC, so make sure who you want to call. Maybe me, Ria, or maybe Miss Ria. So make sure it's don't mix up. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Very happy to be here with you all. And I hope uh, you will be enjoying with this uh, webinar because uh, we invite all the professional people to join with us to give us uh, knowledge and experience regarding the biomechanics and physiotherapy. So, of course, uh, before we start, uh, I would like to give little information about ADC. The, I think some of you come with our name is Regional Development Center, but these years we changed to Area Development Center Jakarta. So before we start the course, I would like to share with you our program for ADC this year. So the first uh, objective of our program is to strengthen the world athletic lecturer. So as you know that we have lecturer in our system, coaches education and certification system, technical official education system, and also some the supporting knowledge like now we have. So we make sure that we have the quality to handle future education system because of this condition. So again that we have uh, the pandemic situation that we never know when will be ended. That's why we know to set up, we have to set up the future education system in order to respond to what um, athletic and education. Then uh, we have to ensure that all athletic member, coaches, technical official, administrator, or uh, sports, uh, sports supporting team, always in touch with knowledge of athletics. This is a very important point that we invite you now in this uh, webinar. And the fourth one is developing member federation, administration, and management skill. So that means we need to maintain and even to develop our all member in athletic, athletic family, in always to develop the uh, knowledge and experience. We already start actually the programs. It's in June. We have what athletic lecturer. Uh, workshop for future education was 8 to 9 June. Then we have also the strength and conditioning course for World Athletic Lecturer, 19 to 20 June. We have 70 CSS lecturer. Now we have already many lecturers in our area. And we have World Athletic Technical Official Webinar. This after the coach, we invite the technical official. So I think will be complete. Then after that, we have Women Technical Official. And we have communication and marketing webinar for the women. And now we have webinar for sports science. The first webinar for sports science is now sport biomechanics and rehabilitation, uh, 30 to 31st August. So it will be have also youth coaches course in September. I think it's uh, early September or in the middle of September. We invite the lecture from our region and we will invite also the coaches from our area. So we have another four activities, the eight webinar for training programs, it will be end of September, and webinar for sport science. The second one will be the sport nutrition. So what athletic from the headquarter, Monaco, will organize gender leadership seminar, but we will share to the people in our area. <laughs> Then the last but not least, incorporating with the member federation, we organize the coaching course and also technical office course, course 
like strength conditioning, sports science, youth coaches, and technical official. So every federation has to organize this kind of course or seminars to have a cooperation with the ADC. We will support you with the certificate and all the material that you need. But uh, I think this will be doing by the member federation and with uh, their lecture. So now, we, before we start, I would like to uh, welcome Mr. York Tashman in this uh, biomechanics and physiotherapy seminars. Mr. York Tashman is the founder of uh, Rehemat Therapy. And I don't know actually the Rehemat Therapy, but uh, Mr. York will be explaining to you what is the Rehemat Therapy and head of reconditioning and rehabilitation is very important stages and National Sport Institute of Malaysia podium program in 2016 to 2018, head of Sport Rehabilitation Center, National Sport Institute of Malaysia 2011-2015, and National Sport Council of Malaysia 1997-2011. So I think this is our first expert. And the second one is uh, Dr. Jackie Nguyen. This is consultant orthopedics and trauma surgeon in Guinegal's Hospital Kuala Lumpur and Subang Jaya Medical Center. President of Malaysia Association of Sport Medicine, MASM, and Vice yeah. President of Asian Federation of Sport Medicine, AFSM, yeah. and involved in professional training and course for postgraduate undergraduate and nursing paramedical. And we have the also uh, another expert here, Ms. Rachel, is the Rehabilitation Therapy, Sport Therapist for National Sport Institute Malaysia, and Head of Sport Science Rehab Therapy Malaysia. So, uh, welcome to our expert. Very warm welcome, and we're very happy to have you all here. And I think we will have a very good time in two days. Our schedule will be today from 10, 11, 15 to 10.30, we'll be have uh, Mr. York Tishman, Dr. Chan, and uh, Ms. Russell. So I think this is just my uh, short speak in this situation, and I am very happy to have you in this station. And thank you very much for coming, and thank you, York, and your friend to come here for our behalf. Thank you very much, and I give the time back to Ria. Ria. Okay, thank you very much, Pak Ria Lindwarsa. And before we start with the class, we would like to announce some rules during we uh, conduct this, this uh, seminar during we are on the class. So first of all, uh, all participants should wear the tidy and casual attire. No smoking. Yeah. <laughs> and please stay on video mode. Micro microphone is on mute mode. If you would like to interrupt, you can unmute and mention your name and your country. And then please write your name, not your device brand. So we, we know it's other who you are. So please, if you use the device brand, please rename your, your, your device or we please inform us so we can, we can do it from our side. And a, per kit, and a particular time, we will ask the uh, per, uh, lecturer to stop for we are making the uh, photo shot. Please understand that this is our control of the attendance. So make sure that we are stop the class and make a photo shot. You are there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And... Now we give the class, we give the time to Mr. York and the team. But York's time is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, good morning everyone. Uh, Yati, hello Malaysia. I can see you very well. Good to see you. By the way, uh, this is Dr. Chan. So we are here already in the office. <laughs> Looking forward. So first of all, thank you very much for ADC to invite us. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to help you out with this yeah, great course. And we were thinking how to do this. Uh, first of all, I want to come back to Reame therapy. Yeah, I was working in ISN and then, yeah, opened my own center and find a good name. 
And when I did my internship in Germany in 91, in a center, the name was Reame. So I called the guy, old man already, and asked, can I use your name? He said, yes. And Reame means actually, Rea in German means rehabilitation, and made is medicine. So these two words come together and that's it. So it's very simple. Yeah. So a little bit about um, the two days. Uh, first of all, I will talk for five minutes and then I give over to my good friend, Dr. Chan. We know each other for a long time and it's a great pleasure to have him here. And I guess uh, you can benefit a lot from him. And then you have to work with me for another two and a half, two and a half hours. Yeah, and we have a lunch break from 12 to 2, when I'm not mistaken, yes. And then I see you again from 2 o'clock to 4. Yes. So, uh, a little bit about my background. I studied sports science. I came to Malaysia in 97. And also in rehabilitation, and they asked me also to coach in Malaysia. So, my athlete won the bronze medal in the Asian Games. So I'm quite happy at the high jumper, Luke Hamsi. Maybe some people still remember him. Quite proud of him. So the good one for me is every time I can talk to all of you. I can talk to the doctors and understand them. And I can talk also to coaches and understand them. And this is a very good call it connection for me. What is going on? Because sometimes as a coach, you have some difficulties because you don't know what's going on with your athletes, nobody inform you, all these things. So, and it's good that we have this course and we want to say the most important thing, and this is a take home message for everyone. Guys, when your athlete is injured, he's not sick. So he can train because only one part of his body is injured. The rest of the body is very healthy. So you can do a lot of things. You can do conditioning programs for him, upper body, when the leg is injured, and maybe the left leg is injured, the right leg is still healthy. So you can do a lot of things. And these two days, we want to show you how to do this. Yeah, and I'm really looking forward, and I hope we have a great time. And I don't want to talk too much today. I give over to my good friend, Dr. Chan, and you enjoy the first hour with him. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Good morning, everybody. Great pleasure to be invited to this program. And I would like to thank uh, Ms. Riaz and Mr. Riaz <laughs> and, and the ADC and you all for participating in this program. And I hope I can contribute to uh, some, some of the information that you guys may find it useful here. Uh, I'm also the Vice President of the Asian Federation of Sports Medicine and the Vice President of the Malaysian Association of Sports Medicine. Uh, and uh, I would like you all, uh, I gather that there's people from various countries here, I would like you all to participate in the Asian Federation of Sports Medicine. If you have a national sports organization, I would like you to contact me through your, uh, or through your national organization, through ASM, to join together as a group and then we can communicate and do more of these courses which is more fitting to our Asian region, okay? Um, and uh, there are lots of things we can do together and I think we should do that and also great opportunities for research in the future as well. So uh, without further ado, let me just uh, move on to the lecture. Uh, let me set this up on share screen. Uh, Bear with me a few minutes. Uh, can you guys see okay. the screen? Is that yes. good? Yes. Okay, it's clear. Great. Excellent. Right. Um, uh, so, without further ado, the talk today is about athletic sports injuries, and it is actually a very, very big topic. So what I thought I'd do is maybe perhaps make it a little bit uh, restricted to a few topics because of time and maybe you can cover the rest of the topics in the future. So you can, as you can see, sports injuries cover soft tissues, shoulders, joints, knees, ankles, foot, and there's a whole gamut of, of injuries. Uh, so in, in view of the time, I would just cluster all, the, all of them together like soft tissue injuries, and we'll talk about that first, and then we'll move on to some of the other topics. 
So maybe a good start is, is define what is injury. Injury is a uh, failure of any body structure due to overloading, all right? And it's due to excessive transfer of energy. And it's a biomechanical phenomenon. And how the uh, injury respond depends on the morphology, which means the bone, the ligaments, the tendon. And each of them have its maximal loading capacity and can be modulated by age, sex, and also the amount of forces and the rate and the direction and the duration that's acting on these tissues. And also don't forget biological tissues have an intrinsic viscoelastic property, which is quite unique. And some of these can be modulated. And training is very important. Uh, training will increase the strength of the tissues and disuse or at, will, will cause atrophy to a lot of these tissues and would add to more of the injuries. Uh, and also, it's also important to remember that the local uh, injury mechanism can determine the, uh, uh, the outcome from a combination of external and internal factors. For example, in the ACL injury, the, the angle of the knee, the motion and the ground reaction forces can all cause a damage in that extent. Uh, another term that is perhaps also important to realize what is strain and what is strain. There's a lot of... Uh, confusion in some uh, areas. Uh, strain is a biomechanical term, which I'm sure you guys are very familiar with. And it's a relative change of the length of the original tissue when the force is applied. Uh, and then uh, the tissues uh, change in length and that you need to do it as a percentage of the, uh, the difference in length as a percentage of the total original length. And that gives you a figure, all right? And, uh, and a lot of these tissues can undergo a lot of uh, strain before it fails. And if it goes beyond a physiological limit, then uh, it will actually tear or result in micro tears or persistent injury. And that, that could lead to a chronic injury itself. When we say sprain, however, when we talk about sprain, it's usually uh, applied to the clinical setting where it is uh, injury to ligaments and joint capsules and soft tissues that connects the bone and, and all this sort of thing. Okay, uh, and uh, what are the signs and symptoms of many acute injuries of these uh, this soft tissue injuries? Well, most of them is caused by trauma, obviously, in, in, in the athletic area. And they will have pain, swelling, instability, bruising, tenderness, and obviously stretch pain. And of, uh, due to the pain, there's loss of function. And you can grade a lot of these uh, sprains as grade one, grade two, grade three, uh, as, as uh, indicated here, from mild tear to incomplete tear with some looseness of the joint to uh, a complete tear, uh, ruptured ligaments to uh, cause uh, joint instability. That's a good classification for ligaments. However, uh, the uh, classification for muscle injury is not very well defined and it's a lot of con controversy involved at the moment. As you can see, the muscles can be damaged from uh, myofibrils to uh, bundles to secondary bundles or a macroscopic tear. Uh, but for clinical purpose, we, we, uh, it's, it's difficult to define for research, but still, we do need to treat these people uh, as a group in that sense. Um, so, for example, uh, in the hamstrings, uh, quite often you can see a lot of injuries and it can be injuries from the attachment of the uh, hamstrings along the ischial uh, tuberosity at the, uh, where the, uh, the back of the uh, inferior aspect of the pelvis. And this is very common, particularly in young children or adolescents who are still growing. There's a uh, physal area, the area that the bone is still growing, uh, where the cartilage is attached. Uh, and then that's the uh, tendon that's attached over the uh, physis there and then it gets pulled due to a weakness in the area and it can cause a lot of pain as one of the causes for hamstring injuries as well and it can present like that or alternatively they can tear in the middle of the muscle as shown here on the right side of the image on, with the MRIs right and or sometimes in the more adult situation, it can actually completely detach from the ischial tuberosity and it will then contract to a, a, a shortened uh, area with a bit of blood and uh, hematoma that can be seen clearly in this white ring where the blood is on the MRI. And these need surgical treatment if they, they are top-flight athletes. 
Now, the intramuscular tears, however, is a little bit more difficult to treat, partly because you cannot stitch muscles. It doesn't work. But there are lots of biological things that we are talking about now, like the PRPs, the uh, growth factors, and all these sort of things. The idea is to stimulate muscle uh, replacement, not with scar tissue, but with muscle fibers, so that it allows the athlete to maintain their, their competitive edge in that sense. The other area that a lot of athletes can get injured is around the groin. As you can see on the left side of the uh, screen, there's a whole list of uh, conditions that can present with groin pain. So it is sometimes quite difficult to figure out what's happening. So it needs a, a, uh, a thorough uh, history and examination and a good idea of the anatomy around that area to figure out which of these are the cause of the pain in the groin. Uh, more interesting for me, this is a coming area that is probably not mentioned before in the past, is, is, is the hip pain, which is a, a common cause for uh, increasingly more recognized as a cause for pain in the groin. Uh, this is to do with uh, femoral acetabular impingement. Um, this is not such a good new concept, it's been around for 10 years or more when people became more and more aware with arthroscopy, how these uh, contribute to the pain in the hip in the front. Essentially what's happening is that uh, the acetabulum is like a socket and the femoral head is uh, like a ball. In the normal anatomy you can see the head attaches to the neck and that's, a, that's kind of like a, a shoulder and a gap and this allows for the movement of the acetabulum uh, into the area of the neck without causing any impingement. But some athletes, especially I think in Caucasians, I, uh, we see more of that, is that what they have what we call a pistol grip deformity on the femoral neck. You can see on the right side of this image here, you can see that neck is rather like a slope without a, a kind of like a divot here to allow for the acetabulum to uh, move into when the, the hip is abducted. Yeah? So that can cause pain in the front of the hip. And this is something may, we may have to look into a little bit more carefully in the future uh, with patients presenting with groin pain. So how do we manage all these pains and strains? I'm sure most of you guys know, you know, uh, price, pain control, R for rest, I for ice, C for compression, and E for elevation. And, and it's quite important to, to, to do all this early to, to enable the return to function quickly. So to control pain, uh, you can give uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, things like ibuprofen, Voltaren, and, and all this sort of thing, or even aspirins. Uh, but the, the more newer versions of these medications are the COX tools like Arcoxia and Celebrax, they're very useful. And it's often very important to remember, these are painkillers, but the primary function is to stop inflammation, which then stops pain. Uh, Panadol, morphine, and all these stops pain, but has no effect on inflammation. So quite often we have to uh, remind our patients when we give these medication that you know they are to stop the inflammation and the pain. And by doing that, they hopefully will get back to function quickly and prevents wasting and reduces the stress. And also more importantly, to prevent chronic pain syndrome. If it goes on for too long, chronic pain syndrome itself is very difficult to treat. And obviously rest is very important. It prevents secondary injury and it reduces the metabolism of the injured part so that it recovers. Mm. Ice is a very simple thing and very effective. It reduces pain, reduces the swelling, reduces the stiffness, and more importantly, it reduces the metabolic requirements and allows for uh, early recovery. Uh, the other point is uh, quite often forgotten is that there should be no direct contact of the ice to the skin. And quite often we see in the clinical situation is that a lot of uh, patients will just leave the ice bag on the knee and they leave it for like long periods of time and it actually induces uh, ice burn on the skin. All right, so what you want is a piece of uh, cloth that allows to uh, fluid to be absorbed. So what you want is cold and dry, not cold and wet. And it needs to be moved every 15 minutes or so to prevent these sort of issues. And compression is very important. Uh, you need to support the injured part. And more importantly, by uh, providing support, it immobilizes the joint and allows things to heal. 
And by uh, not moving it too much, it also reduces the swelling and the muscle spasms, which then reduces the pain. Uh, elevation is another very simple, effective uh, uh, way of, of controlling the swelling. And it's important to remember that you need to elevate the injured part to the horizontal level of the heart. This is to reduce the uh, uh, swelling by improving the venous return. The, the blood flowing out to the limb then flows back easily and, and it will reduce the inflammation from that respect and also reduces the uh, pain and often also reduces the stiffness. And it's important to know that uh, the magic number in soft tissue injuries is six weeks. Anything that goes beyond six weeks with persistent pain, then you should seek uh, medical advice soon and then to prevent any long-term uh, repercussions as a result. Um, moving on to shoulder instability, that's another big area. Uh, so what I thought I'll pick a few, um, the common ones. Uh, common in conditions that affect uh, particularly athletes is a dislocation of shoulders. Um, but to understand that, one needs to be aware that there's such a thing as laxity and also instability. Laxity means uh, it's a necessary um, attribute of the capture of the ligaments to the shoulder. And it allows the normal range of motion to the joint. This is the most mobile joint in your body. And uh, instability means that they start developing pain and symptoms as when they move the, uh, the head, the humeral head in, uh, in the glenoid uh, during active range of motion. So if that's the case, then we call it instability and it needs to be treated. What produces uh, or affords stability in the shoulder is very different from what affords stability in the lower limbs. In the shoulder, most of the support is actually from soft tissues. As you can see here, in the shoulder, the scapula, the area of the glenoid compared to the humeral head is very, very small. It's only like 20% in contact. So uh, the body actually uh, has different means of trying to make it more stable by angulating the, the glenoid a bit upwards and more forwards so that it faces forwards and upwards to support the humeral head. And the humeral head itself is also angulated 45 degrees up and backwards. Uh, and as a result, the scapula also is slightly tilted upwards towards the sky. More importantly, in the glenoid, there is a fibrocartilage ring, which is called the uh, labrum, here in this diagram. And you can see that it actually deepens the socket quite a bit. Right? It is this labrum that is very, very important. And this labrum will have attachment of these ligaments. Yeah. These are uh, thickenings and, and condensation of tissues around the uh, uh, glenohumeral joint. Uh, there are quite a few of them, the, the superior, the middle, and the inferior. And these form like check rings, like ropes to pr uh, provide stability of the glenoid from uh, um, dislocating. And more importantly, it functions like a hammer to allow, cradles the head and allows the humeral head to move in different directions particularly in the ABBA position, the abducted external rotated position, as you can see in this image here on the right. And this provides stability and stops the humeral head from falling out at the anterior inferior aspect of the cranial humeral joint. Once the humeral head dislocates, most of the time it dislocates through the front. And as you can see at the front, there are very important things running just in front of the glenohumeral joint. Uh, there are blood vessels and there are major nerves and major veins. So if you could imagine here, if this head falls out, it will compress on the uh, blood vessel here and it can cause damage, uh, circulation problems, and also even nerve issues if it's not treated early. So any dislocation of the shoulder needs to be treated uh, soon and not to be left for too long. Late presentation makes it very difficult to put it back and also uh, creates a lot of complications. Once the head falls out, this is the view from the axilla shooting up to the, hum the head. You can see this is the coracoid on the front, this is the acromion at the back, and this is the humeral head, and this is the glenoid. Uh, the axillary view and the x-ray will show you very well whether the head actually falls out to the front or through the back. When it falls out through the front, the corner, the anterior inferior corner of the glenoid can sometimes cause a divot, a damage, a compression fracture to the humeral head. 
And as a result, if it is as big as this here in this image, when the humeral head rotates, it can actually fall out and that glenoid will catch this area and the whole humeral head can get locked and jammed. Like in this view, you can imagine that this fellow yeah. actually extends the... Uh, uh, 3068A. The, the glenoid will engage over this fracture. So these are too big to be treated uh, with uh, uh, arthroscopic surgery and it may need a bone graft to fill up that defect. This is on the humeral side, okay? Now on the glenoid side, the uh, shoulder instability uh, can, can also uh, can be graded uh, in terms of uh, traumatic or atraumatic. But it, you need to understand that there is actually a gradation, a continuum from very stiff shoulders in some athletes to very, very loose shoulders in others. And it's certain sports that requires certain types of um, uh, laxity to, to have the edge. So laxity itself is not a problem, but when they have pain, that becomes an issue. And that's where we have to address and treat. And once it dislocates, it needs to be put back. And shoulder dislocation has been around since the Egyptian times, you know, we can see it in the hieroglyphics. Uh, but the simplest and safest way to put it back is by gentle traction, about 45 degrees uh, uh, away from the patient in the vertical, and with counter traction on the opposite side to push it back. Do not do the cocker maneuver, which is the traditional old fashioned way of doing it. Uh, which means you, you pull the humerus in, uh, in, in this direction, but you extra rotate and then you AD that move the shoulder, elbow to the midline and then you internally rotate. The problem with that is that if it's not properly reduced, there's a real chance you will fracture the neck of the humerus, which then makes things 10 times more difficult for the surgeon to fix. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and there are lots of tests you can do to, to ascertain the, the um, uh, stability. I don't know what's happened to my image here. Okay, never mind. Uh, this is a test. We call it the drawer test. You can see this is very, very unstable. This head is slopping front and back in the glenohumeral joint. And you can see when he pulls the arm, there's a sulcus sign that the sort of indentation of the soft tissue around here due to the negative suction effect of the glenoid when it uh, is being uh, sort of uh, dragged down. And during the operation, one can also do some tests to see how stable they are by applying a vertical loading and then you dislocate the humerus and then push it back by AD ducting. It goes in and then it's out and it's in again. So this is how the humeral head dislocates and damages the glenoid. So this is the position we put the patient usually on the side. And these are the camera portals, the holes that we put the cameras and the working instruments through the front. And this is uh, what we do. What essentially is that there's a tear around this region where the, the, the glenoid completely gets ripped off. And what we do is we put all these little anchors and then you put stitches to reattach the glenoid. And also sometimes you take bites of this tissue of the uh, capsule to tighten things up a bit. And this is what it looks like at a mic uh, more microscopic level. Uh. And this is what happens when the glenoid, dis uh, the humeral head dislocates and it rips off this fibrous ring, they call it the labrum, and the anchor itself is to tie this all back to where it was all intended. So this is a uh, image where the humeral head is removed and you can see once it dislocates, it, this is the area that's damaged. And if it's big enough, sometimes, unfortunately, a big chunk of the bone is, is also uh, involved. And that makes it a very, very difficult situation. Then that requires a bone block to reattach. Either you reattach the bone or you take bone from somewhere to fill up that space and then you reattach all this glenoid, uh, the labrum, to the bone to provide stability. And these are just arthroscopic image. You can see the tear there. That's the anchor into the glenoid. And then the stitches, then that's what happens when we tie them back. And you can see that's now a reattachment of the labrum and a bump that provides the uh, stopper oh, effect. To patient. Moving on to the next one is a chromoclavicular joint injury, which is a very common one, particularly with uh, contact spots. But uh, even athletes, running athletes, do sometimes fall and can sustain this sort of injury. And they often present with pain. 
uh, and and uh, is often over the uh, distal end of the uh, clavicle here, and and it lying on the side is very painful, and there's lots of elevation, and the pain is particularly worse at the end range of elevation, forward flexion and a deduction, and occasionally you will see they may even have crepitus. Strength, however, is normal, all right, and this is the the classification that's been used. And obviously, uh, mild uh, type 1 and type 2, we generally don't need to have any surgical intervention. Type 3 depends on the symptoms and the sports the athlete uh, performs. Uh, for upper limb loading type of sports, then they probably have to talk about some sort of surgical intervention. And the more important one is the type 6. Remember, I said that there's the front here, there are blood vessels and nerves. If this clavicle actually dislocates and goes under the coracoid, it can damage blood vessels and nerve. This is quite a dangerous condition. So obviously, uh, if it's, it's this sort of thing, then, then surgical intervention is uh, urgently needed. Yeah. And this is just say another representation. So sometimes when the situation is so uh, painful the, we, and the ligaments are still intact, what we do is just remove the bone using keyhole surgery, like just now, using a burr to remove all these bones. Uh, and at the back of this bone here, which is the acromion, and this is the clavicle right at the back. And then we remove a little bit of the uh, distal end of the clavicle and the uh, acromion, and that will stop the pain. It's called a Mumford procedure. It's a very simple procedure, and it works very well in controlling pain. And it affords normal movements. These is, this is only uh, adequate provided the ligaments are intact. But when these ligaments are damaged completely and it's type 3 to 6, then you have to talk about reconstructing ligaments or you can stabilize it in the acute setting with a screw. Uh, and in a chronic situation, you might want to uh, talk about reconstructing these ligaments with uh, hamstrings, orthographs or allografts and, and, and tie them down uh, with, with the bioabsorbable screws. And sometimes you can reinforce it with all these buttons. So that's the AC joint. <coughs> Moving on to the rotator cuff injury. And this is not so common in, 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 in uh, running sports, but uh, it, it sometimes happens as a result of fall. It can be in young patients or old patients, older patients, and they often present with pain with overhead activities and more importantly, weakness in lifting their arms up. Uh, and more importantly, night pain is the one that usually gets them the pain never goes away and it's always there at night and stops them from sleeping. And that's how they will usually present. And the position where they complain of the pain is around the humerus, the proximal humerus here, not here. When they complain of pain over this side, just over the shoulder, then you have to think about it may not necessarily be a rotator cuff tear. Uh, and quite often you can see there's wasting uh, over the supraspinatus fossa, swelling over the anterior shoulder if there's a big hole with fluid leaking out from the glenial humeral joint and the humeral head can be prominent anteriorly and not uncommonly you will also see a Popeye uh, tendon uh, rupture, biceps tendon rupture and there's a Popeye muscle over the anterior aspect of the arm and, and there's tenderness over the greater tuberosity and over the supraspinatus fossa and of course, there's also tenderness over the AC joint, bicepital groove with loss of range of motion, and more importantly, weakness. They cannot resist elevation when you test them. And if they present late, then they, have develop, they will develop stiff shoulders because it's too painful, they haven't used it, and this is the end result. And on the MRI, you can see that, you know, uh, there's a, a gap here. This is what a normal MRI looks like. There's continuity of the muscle with the tendon over the greater tuberosity but over here you can see there's a gap and there's fluid from the humeral joint leaking up to the subacromial space through this gap and that usually for athletes you need to proceed with surgery because without surgery these supraspinatus muscle will waste this is a normal supraspinatus fossa in the scapula you can see this is wasted and some of them can undergo fatty degeneration and if that's the case it's too late um, the muscle may not return to what it was before. So early intervention, especially in an athlete, is important with rotator cuff tear in a young person. 
the idea of the uh, rotary cuff is to, to balance the, the force so that the force couple is balanced and it can move and be controlled in the range of motion. Uh, and without that, they can get pain. The humeral head will not maintain itself in the middle of the socket in the glenoid and it will translate upwards, forwards, backwards, everywhere and that adds to the pain. So uh, arthroscopically through keyhole, we, we check, see whether these tendons can be pulled back to where it was intended. And if we can, then we usually would uh, put a screw uh, over the greater tuberosity, that's where the tear usually happens. And you can see that hole there, this is now looking from outside the uh, glenohumeral joint in the subacromal space. You put an anchor in there, and then uh, you put sutures, and then you tie these tendons back to where these sutures are. Uh, through these anchors, yeah? Okay, let me just speed this up a bit. Okay, you can see the stitches, the stitches, and then they, we then pass it through the tendon and then reattach it. So, uh, the other alternative way of doing it is the old-fashioned way without uh, keyhole surgery is to make a big incision. <laughs> then you make multiple drill holes through the bone and then you attach the stitches and then tie this tendon back to where it was intended. Uh, with these screws, life is a lot easier and it can be done keyhole-wise. You can see before and then the after image where the tendons are now reattached. And this usually gets rid of that pain and then it takes about six to eight weeks to heal and then they need proper rehabilitation and strength training only after eight weeks onwards. Yeah. So, and this is what it looks like on the x-rays with these metallic anchors. These are the old-fashioned ones. Nowadays, we use plastics so you can't see them and it doesn't beep when you go to the airport. <laughs> Moving on to the lower limbs, we have uh, ACL injuries, which is a very, very common thing in a lot of uh, athletes in the running sports and, and contact sports like football. Um, it's important that a lot of uh, animals have ACL. Human, cow, sheep, goat, pigs, dogs, and even rabbits. And they all have uh, two ligaments, in fact. Um, the prominent two, there's actually three. The third one is the intermediate oh, one, which is not very, very big. So it's not just a single structure. Like in this anatomical dissection, you can see the AM bundle, and then there's another PL bundle, and this is the PCL. This is with the knee flexed at 90 degrees. You can see this. And, and you can see how it works very differently. This is the AM and the PL. You see an inflection, the PL now goes to the front and it's quite high up to the AM, which originally started much higher. Uh, the reason for that is because it allows the knee to rotate in flexion. If they do not have this dual system, it's very difficult for the knee to rotate in flexion. And you need some degree of rotation to have uh, efficient um, uh, move motion of your knee to propel yourself forwards and running and jumping sports and quite often it can get injured like what happens here in this badminton player you can look at the left knee that's how she does it so she lands on the, the jumping part is the easy part it's usually the landing part and particularly in girls and you can see that her hips her knees are in bulgus and when they jump they land in bulgus uh, external rotated and the femur is internal rotated on the on the, on the tibia and that's how they get it uh, sustain this injury and tests like the Larkman test shown here is very, very uh, pattern of a ACL tear. If you can get a knee to move like that, you can be sure it's the ACL is gone. Uh, and in a young athlete, you will want to talk about surgery. And the pivot shift is another test. And again, this is very specific test for ACL instability. Uh, and and once if you get these two signs, it is almost certainly the ACL is gone and it needs to be fixed in a young person and athlete. Uh, conservative treatment is not very helpful. Uh, it's important also to realize that these two bundles actually sit in different areas in the femur and the tibia. Uh, and, uh, and that's because on anatomical dissection, you can see on the tibial surface, the PL and the AM is, is very, very big. And that's what we try to replicate. You can see it on the MRI. You've got two bundles, okay? AM and PL. Uh, and uh, what we try to do now is to replicate this with a uh, surgery that is the double bundle technique, which I will mention in a minute. 
this is an MRI showing a complete tear of the ACL where the bundle now has completely fallen down uh, from the attachment at the, at the, uh, the femur uh, aspect on the lateral view. And you can see a lot of swelling and you can see the tibia is relatively translated anterior relative to the femur in this view. So how do we fix this? Well, we do it uh, this way with one leg up and one leg down. This is the operated side through little keyholes. Um, the way we harvest the autograph is through a little separate incision here at the proximal tibia. We take the semitendinosus and the, sem uh, and the gr gracilis from here and then we will pass through drill holes on the femur and the tibia and pass it through and fix it with screws, okay? As you can see, we're trying to replicate the, uh, the two different angles which the ACL has to uh, the double bundles so that they will replicate what uh, God intended in that sense. So these are just operative images showing the, how it's done with two separate wires, with two separate tunnels. Uh, this may not be possible in all patients. And sometimes the patients are too small that technically it is not feasible. In which case then uh, the single tunnel may be the only option. But it's not the end of the world. Uh, this double bundle technique is still a little bit controversial as some people uh, think that it doesn't contribute a lot more to stability. But uh, my impression that I've been doing this for the past uh, six years, uh, it, it gives a better range of motion and stability in all the different angles of uh, flexion of the knee. Uh, these are the operative images showing the, uh, the two tunnels on the femur side. Uh, as the graph has been put in, you can see when you test in flexion, this uh, AM is tight, the PL is loose. But when, when you do it in extension, you can see now the two, two bundles now become parallel and the more extension there is, you can see now it, it overlaps each other and when you pull, the PL now is stiff. We secure these graphs with all these uh, uh, metal buttons and buy dissolvable screws inside the tunnel to provide stability and incorporation of the graft inside the tunnel. And the incorporation can take up to nine months with hamstrings. For BTB, you can uh, accelerate your rehab and uh, return to sports, perhaps up to six months. But in general, the, the, the ligaments still undergoes a lot of uh, biological changes. And these are the final x-rays you can see uh, with the two little buttons, two separate tunnels on the tip, a femur side. And then on the side, there are two separate tunnels with two separate dissolvable screws here. Quite often uh, associated with the ACL tear, the meniscal tear, uh, patients can present with a history of twisting in the knee and they feel a clung and a click at the time. And, and after that, they are unable to continue running or playing their sports. Um, swelling can be immediate or it can pro progress slowly over the next few weeks and they have difficulty weight bearing. And more importantly, they cannot squat, all right? And when you test the knee, the knee is actually stable. Uh, there may be intermittent uh, locking and stiffness uh, that gives, usually gives you some idea this is a meniscal problem because it's a mechanical thing that is loose that is moving in and out of the joint and locking it. And this gives, causes them a pain and then the knee gives way intermittently. And when you examine them, they may have a lot of fluid effusion in the knee. And in a delayed presentation, they may have a lot of wasting. And when the knee is a bit stuck, they can have five degrees of fixed flexion and they may also lose the last 10 degrees of full flexion. And, and obviously when you do the ACL test, the Lachman, the pivot shift, all this is all pretty normal. Uh, the McMurray's test is quite helpful, but it is not a very sensitive or specific test. Still it's worthwhile doing it. And the technique is to put your, your thumb and your index finger along the joint line and you apply a rotational force with a bit of vulgar stress and virus stress as you go into full extension. And quite often you can feel either a click or pain over the lateral or the middle aspect of the joint that will give you some idea where the location of the tear is. And the meniscus itself is a relatively a vascular structure. It sits between the femur and the tibia over here. Uh, as you can see in this stain image, uh, the blood supply is really at the periphery on the inner third, there's hardly any blood supply. So once the meniscus is torn, it doesn't actually heal. And the reason is that because the blood supply is so poor. 
And you can divide this into the inner third, the middle third, or the outer third. Those at the outer third or the middle junction between the middle third or outer third, those are the best ones to heal with stitching. Those with the uh, inner third or inner part of the junction between middle third and out, uh, middle third or inner third, those cannot usually be fixed and uh, in the sense that we don't usually suture those and it's also very small, so we would normally remove that bit. Um, much of it is, uh, much of the meniscus is damaged mainly at the back. As you can see, you need to do a knee roll back uh, before you can actually flex your knee more than 108, uh, more than 90 degrees. Uh, because if, if, if the knee do, does not roll back, then there's no way uh, people would be able to uh, squat. So the, by virtue of the way the anatomy and the ligaments function, it will have to roll back. And when it rolls back, it sometimes traps the meniscus at the back and it gets squashed between the femur and the tibia and that's how the meniscal tear happens most of the time. So uh, in the acute setting, you price, as we say, pain, rest, eyes, compression and elevation is important. Uh, and once it's uh, resolved and there's no flexion deformity, then usually they can function back to its normal, then we generally leave it alone. But physiotherapy is important to prevent any muscle wasting and, and stiffness of the knee. But if the knee is locked, like uh, there's a five, 10 degrees uh, fixed flexion deformity uh, or loss of full flexion, then surgery is almost certainly required. And, and uh, the, there's persistent pain and swelling, that's another indication for a meniscal surgery as well. The tear pattern can be uh, various, patterns as shown here in the left side. It can be a, a, a longitudinal tear. If it slips inside into the center of the joint, it can be a displaced bucket handle, or it can be a parabeat tear like that, and a displaced flap which rotated 180 degrees on itself, or a radial tear like that, and you get a complex one, which makes life very difficult, and it may not be stitchable or an incomplete tear, where it tears only on the top surface or the undersurface. And when there's a big bucket, Tear, it sometimes can lock the knee because this part has now slipped into the uh, center of the joint and it blocks the knee from full extension. Uh, these are operative images showing a flap tear that has rotated. This is at the back of the knee. The round ball on the top is the femur and the flat surface on the bottom is the tibia. And uh, this is the lateral side. You can see there's a very big tear it's very, very loose. And this is what we mean by this meniscus slipping inside and jamming the knee. And that's how we fix this with stitches and the uh, junction, uh, of the uh, cap meniscal capsule junction and the middle uh, third of the meniscus with these non-dissolvable stitches to provide stability and prevent locking. If these are not treated long-term, the articular surface of the cartilage on the femur or on the tibia will get damaged, like you can see here they can actually cause a lot of uh, gouging out damage and bits and pieces of the college will fall out and eventually the, the athlete will develop osteoarthritis. So that's one of the major indications for trying to fix this early. If you leave it for too long, more chondral damage can occur. And these are the operative images. That's how we do, we put a stitch in and then the stitches, you then pull and, and then you can cut the stitches off. Once it's done, you can see it's quite stable. You put multiple stitches and after that you probe it with a hook and then the meniscus is very stable and doesn't cause any further problems. And the hope is that the, the meniscal, meniscal capsule junction will heal with scarring and provide stability to the meniscal tear. Uh, moving on to the chondral injury, you can see that uh, if it's not treated, all these bits and pieces will fall off and it will be acting like more stone pebbles inside the knee joint, causing more damage and more arthritis. And when it's completely down to bone, sometimes what we do is we drill multiple holes to encourage blood and bleeding and stem cells from inside the bone marrow to come up to fill up that space. Uh, it's useful to do that, but it, the results are not long-term uh, satisfactory in that sense. It will last but up to two years, and this is one of our holy grails in orthopedic surgery, try to fix this, try to figure out what to do. And the next more, most common thing is, is a patella instability. These are often uh, in females and young ladies with anterior knee pain. They present with apprehension and, and uh, on twisting and difficulty climbing stairs. 
And quite often, they have poor muscle uh, control, the quads are wasted, and they also have a very high Q angle, and external tibial torsion of the femur, uh, sorry, tibia, and also femoral neck antiversion, these needs to be looked at carefully. And this group of patients with patellar instability is very difficult to treat and need, difficult to diagnose the cause for this problem. And all this uh, imaging is very important because you then help to show how shallow the trochlear groove is. And, and from there, you can plan your surgery. Generalized laxity is another additional factor that needs to be looked at. So x-rays is a basic uh, baseline and then MRI is very important. Uh, Non-operative treatment requires physiotherapy and uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatories for pain control. Uh, if that fails, then stabilization procedures needs to be considered. It can be bony procedures, soft tissue procedures, or soft tissue reconstruction procedures like the MPFL reconstruction, which is now uh, more uh, current, more and more favored in that sense. And when you do an X, uh, MRI or X-ray, you can see what happens sometimes when the patella dislocates. It can actually take a fraction, a, a fragment of the uh, articular surface of the uh, uh, retropatellar surface with a fracture fragment coming off, or it can fracture the lateral aspect of the lateral femur condyle over the anterior aspect, and then that little piece can float inside the joint and cause jamming and locking. And also, there's also bone swelling of the lateral femoral condyle, and obviously a lot of bleeding as well. So this is now the current favorite mode of treatment is to reconstruct the MPFL and may or may not include a lateral release, a release from inside the capsule so that the patella now will remain in the right position. Ankle injuries is uh, another area that's very, very common, uh, particularly with running sports. Uh, and to start off with, we talk about Achilles tendon. Uh, Achilles tendon is, is, is a common injury. It can occur in an acute setting or chronic setting. Uh, in this acute setting, they may have sudden onset of pain, they may even hear a snap noise, uh, and then there's completely loss of power and they cannot continue running, and there'll be severe pain. Uh, but in a chronic situation, they have pain after running, and it doesn't that go away and eventually they form scarring and, and, and a palpable lump in the back of the Achilles tendon. Uh, in the acute setting on examination, you'll see there's bruising, swelling, tenderness, and the Thompson's test is positive. The Thompson's test involves uh, lying the patient prone and squeezing the calf. And if you squeeze the calf, the, the ankle does not plant our flanks. That means there's a discontinuity of the Achilles tendon. And when you palpate, there's actually a gap in the Achilles tendon, which doesn't, uh, uh, that will cause the Achilles uh, tendon to be painful and also unable to plant a flex with, with uh, any great amount of strength. MRI ultrasound is very useful to diagnose this. Uh, the non-operative meat treatment is put them in a cast or walking boot with a foot plant a flex, but usually for an athlete, uh, surgery would be a better option. It can be done through a small incision or through a large incision. Now, the uh, MRIs are very, very important in this situation because you can differentiate, you know, different aspects of where the, the tear is and the pathology is. And in the tendinosis situation, where these are chronic, they have multiple repeated injuries, but small enough to cause the pain, but not big enough to, to cause a tear. And, and eventually they will undergo changes inside and it can be gel gelatinous type of material and it can be quite extensive. Eventually the Achilles tendon will weaken because it's like a hollow in the cylinder and it may snap. Quite often it will snap in the, uh, the, the, the upper, um, just about one or two inches over the calcaneus right at that junction. Uh, or occasionally, it can actually uh, evolve and tear from the insertion. So how the tear occurs will determine what we need to do to repair it. And obviously, non-operative treatment is quite important when, uh, to prevent this sort of thing. Uh, so once they heal up in the acute setting, if there's no complete tear, is to rehabilitate them with a uh, uh, eccentric uh, sort of uh, rehabilitation program for the Achilles tendon. For a complete tear, you can see that there's discontinuity of the tendon. This is the proximal end, and this is the distal end. This is a mid-substance tear. And uh, normally, we would be uh, pulling it out and then passing sutures and then tying it up. 
for the insertional avulsion uh, tears, normally we will put suture anchors with the like the ones on the rotator cuff, and then we have these sutures to tie this back down to where it was supposed to be, uh, and that usually will help to solve the uh, the problem. Uh, moving on to the next one, the ankle sprains, which is extremely common in running athletes and, and, and uh, jumping athletes, uh, are injuries around the anterior talofibular ligament and the calcaneofibular ligament. And as we said, the grading can be one, two, three, depending on uh, the extent of the tear. Uh, and these are the two ligaments. If you tear the anterior talofibular ligament with the calcaneofibular ligament intact, then you may get away without, non, without uh, operative treatment. But if both these two ligaments are torn, then surgical intervention is almost certainly required. And the mechanism of injury is this uh, supination injury where the foot is in this position. The inversion, uh, eversion injury is not so common. Uh, if this eversion, then the deltoid on the medial side, the ligaments on the medial side is the one that gets hit. And on a high ankle sprain where the foot is plantar grade and there's a rotation, so the tear may occur higher up, not the ATFL, but the, uh, the, the syndesmotic ligament up further up on the tibiofibular joint. Uh, in the acute situation, you can see bruising, a lot of swelling and pain. And the best way to treat it is to ice it, rest it, and support it with a bandage. Uh, even a ankle stirrup would be helpful. Uh, but in a very uh, more severe situation, the boot will be uh, more comfortable uh, and then uh, they need to wear this for most of the time to, to, uh, to see if that helps to heal. And if it doesn't heal at six weeks, then you have to consider surgery as a, as a necessity, necessary option. And these are the tests that one could do. You can do an anterior draw test. Uh, you should also do a tailor tube test. And this can be done uh, under stress view in, in x-ray department and you apply the stretch you can see this opening of this gap on the lateral side of the tibial tailor joint and the suction sign here when you do the anterior door test there's a just like in the sulcus sign in the shoulder that's a, an indentation due to the negative effect negative pressure effect of the joint being pulled forward uh, we can see even on the x-ray there's a gap there posteriorly when stressed uh, these are this is the one of one of the cases I've done. You can see it translates forwards with the draw test a lot. Yeah. And this is compared to the normal side. It doesn't move at all. That's a pre-op. Oh, sorry. And this is post-op. Once we fix it with the brostrum repair, you can see it doesn't move very much now. All right. Uh, and then this is just a normal size. So it's well within the normal range. That's what we want to do. We don't want to over tighten things and uh, don't want, certainly don't want to give it too loose. So the brostrum repair is, is, is a reattachment of all these ligaments and then reinforcing it with the retinaculum here. Okay. The, the way we do it is normally to put a, a suture anchor over the anterior distal fibula here and another anchor for the, uh, the calcaneofibular ligament. And that would help to uh, tie these ligaments back and then you reinforce it with the retinaculum. Uh, other alternatives, the old fashioned way to do it is to use the perineal brevis tendon and then do a kind of a loop. The, the not so good part of this is that this stiffens the subtalar joint too extensively and it's not very good for athletes to be too stiff with the subtalar joint, particularly with running and jumping sports, they will have pain in the subtalar joint and perhaps even arthritis at the later stage. We're nearly to the end now, so stress fracture. <laughs> stress fracture is very common in, in people who do a lot of running and jumping. It's due to repetitive trauma and it can have a localized swelling and pain and pain or weight bearing. Uh, investigations involve x-rays and MRIs and when it's not very clear then, then even a, a, a bone scan is very helpful to see where the issue is. Uh, uh, initially, non-operative treatment would be the best if it's not too displaced and usually it should not be displaced because these are very uh, like hairline fractures that one sometimes is very difficult to spot and that's why the bone scan is quite helpful. Um, so you, you need to rest it and if necessary, put a plaster, plaster of Paris, and then and you need to offload the foot to, to let it rest. And in, in situations where they run into non-union or uh, 
displacement of the fracture or pain in spite of non-operative treatment, then surgical treatment may be necessary. As you can see here on the x-ray here, there's a stress fracture at the base of the uh, fifth toe and it's failed to heal and sometimes you may have to put wires to hold things together and then compress it to allow healing to happen. Uh, don't forget you can get a similar situation over the sesamoid and there can be pain over the plantar aspect of the big toe, particularly when you dorsiflex and these to do with runners who end up uh, with a lot of pain. And these fractures can involve many other joints. Uh, tibia is the next most common area, the proximal shaft or the mid shaft. Uh, and and uh, sometimes it, it, uh, it's difficult to tell and that's where the bone scan is useful. Um, and if it's uh, usually they don't need surgical intervention, but just rest, yeah. Uh, and and the, the number of the duration for healing uh, varies which, which depends on which bone on a femur it takes about uh, 12 weeks the femur the tibia also about 12 weeks the metatarsal about four weeks and that kind of thing all right so the the, the toes will certainly be a lot faster and the femur and the tibia are usually a lot longer because it takes a lot of stress and pressure and if they present late, you can see the, the callus forming over the, the very hairline kind of fracture area, uh, which is very common over the metatarsal in the foot, in, in this case in the third one, and this one on the fifth uh, the fourth toe. Uh, and these are the things that you can see. Um, I think I've come to the end of my talk. I hope I haven't uh, uh, bombarded you guys with too much information, but if you need any further clarification, I'm uh, delighted to... Uh, Hang around to see if you guys want any questions, to answer any questions. Yeah. Okay. There we are. Right. You go in the middle. Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, are there any questions? Okay, all right. Are there any questions from anybody to clarify anything? Hello, uh, my name is Ali and I'm from Pakistan. So ah. my question is regarding about the ligament injury. So especially as you mentioned, like when there is like grade one and grade two injury, uh, we, we can put cast or any bracing or any like to immo immobilize the joint. So my question in that regard, what is uh, like a, an ideal time frame to keep that cast and bracing to heal ligament properly? And what is the and like approximate duration of that grade one and grade two ligament healing? I, I think uh, the, the healing time, it can be very, uh, can vary quite a bit depending on the extent of the injury. Uh, as a general rule, you should treat it like a fracture. Uh, for around the lower limbs, it takes about six weeks. As we said, six weeks is the magic number. Yeah, uh, and, and immobilization should be the very minimum four weeks and then you reassess. If there's no swelling, there's not much pain, you can start early rehab, gentle range of motion, don't go to the extremes. The, the idea is to maintain the muscles in good shape, but not necessarily stressing the ligament that is trying to heal. And you still need to protect it for a further two weeks. And usually I would wait after six weeks, then if there's no pain, then I will go full blast, you know, full range of motion, full strengthening program, and then escalate from there to the sport specific program later on. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, Dr. Shan. Hi. I'm Raj Mohan from India. Yeah. Uh, I just want to clarify one thing regarding the calcaneum spur. Uh, is it a very uh, situation that we have to remove that calcaneum spur for an athletic person? The you mean calcaneum spur. The plantar is, aspect, is it? The yeah, plantar, plantar, spur. plantar. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I see a lot of this. Actually, if you look carefully, the calcaneum spur is not the cause. A lot of people get the, this impression that the spur is the, the problem. It's actually a response to tibialis posterior tendon weakness. 
because the tibialis posterior tendon actually maintains your medial aspect of your arch in the foot. So as the tibial, tibialis posterior weakens over time, the arch flattens out. And when it flattens out, it will pull the plantar fascia that's attached over the calcaneal spur region. And over a long period of time, the bone will respond by growing longer and longer. So to me, the calcaneal spur is very rarely a problem. In, in my entire career, I've only probably operated on one patient. <laughs> but almost always, you need to check the tibialis posterior tendon. That is the cause. And, and it's actually part of the tibialis posterior tendon dysfunction syndrome, I would call it. You also need to lengthen, stretch out the Achilles tendon, which is often uh, another cause for this problem. Because if your, if your tibialis posterior is weak, your hind foot will go into valgus. When it goes into valgus, the Achilles tendon is never stretched. And once it's left in that position for too long, now the tibialis posterior cannot win. It cannot pull the hind foot back into varus. Yeah? And as a result, it causes stiffness as well to the, the uh, you know, dorsiflexion of your ankle and which compounds the problem. So, so I would suggest you look at the tibialis posterior carefully and examine them, test them for strength, coordination as well. Uh, and and, and uh, one simple way I would normally do it, get them to stand on tiptoe and you do like the Trendelenburg test, you ask them to put their hands on your hand, tiptoe, and then take one leg off the foot, the, the good one, the, the symptomatic one, off the foot first so that they stand on one single heel raise on the uh, asymptomatic side to get a feel that you know how strong they are then you get them to stand on the symptomatic side with one foot and you can see they will sway all over the place and they will get pain so that's just one rough estimate you know the tip how, how good the tibialis posterior tendon is and from there you have to address the, uh, the appropriate rehabilitation program and, 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 and uh, that sort of thing yeah. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Anything else? Good. Well, I'll hand over to uh, uh, you all. First of all, thank you very much, Mr. Jim. Pleasure Sunday morning thank to you. come over thank here. You. Thank you. I guess we have a five minutes break. Yeah. Catch a drink and then I see you in five minutes. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Nice meeting Ria. you all. Okay. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you, uh, Ria and Miss Ria. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Chan. Thank you. Bye-bye. Enjoy. Bye. Enjoy. Bye.